right let's um, let's get started so we are looking at chapter 2 right um i'll just project that so the purpose of the local church so when we consider the purpose of the local church you know what is the reason for which the church exists right so um it'll be good i think to have a to do a questionnaire and to and to check with people and find out you know do you know why the church exists that generally people who are you know attending a church right attending a church service and it could be a good exercise to do maybe have a questionnaire and say what do you think is a church right do you uh, what do you think is the purpose of the church why does the church exist why do you attend the church right so i think the the responses could be interesting and it's good to find that out see that when people attend a church do they really you know understand or are they growing in the understanding that the church has a purpose right um as individuals we have a purpose in god so does the church have a purpose well as ministers of god we definitely need to understand this you know that the church has a purpose and uh, for us to have an understanding of that will give us greater clarity as we lead our congregation or you know as as a part of a leadership team as we minister in a local church right as we give leadership to the local church right so so there is a purpose and it goes all the way back to the great commission and the lord jesus says this is what you need to do go into all the world and preach the gospel to every every creature and then he says you know this is the authority that has been given to me and because of that authority i'm saying to you go therefore right he uses the word therefore you know all authority has been given so go therefore knowing you know from the authority that i have i'm commissioning you to go and make disciples okay so who's a disciple a follower uh, one who follows the teachings one who follows the principles one who follows the person right um and that that's a disciple follows closely right and so um like other things also follows at a cost follows despite sacrifices follows you know uh, to the point of death and so on so we see that person is a dis disciple right so he's saying go make disciples right so don't stop by in other words you know you share the gospel yes but then you make disciples which means they are going to interact you're going to spend time you're going to you're going to journey together because disciple making doesn't happen on a day right it doesn't happen uh it might start with an altar call but it doesn't you know it doesn't uh, end there right it continues through life right so saying make disciples of all the nations baptizing them etc and then teaching them to observe all things that i have commanded you so it's not just one encounter that's something that we understand right you meet someone you share the gospel they may may not receive they may accept they may reject whatever but this disciple making is a long term thing you know it's not a one time event or an encounter right so as a church it's it's good for us to come to terms with that you know get to grips with that saying that it's not about you know uh, it's not about meeting and then going on it's it's about actually staying putting roots uh it's a process right so that is what lord is saying so which means if that is the commission then there needs to be a process for the, there needs to be a method right but the lord jesus he just said okay go this is what you need to do. you don't need to go make disciples then he, he did not give anything further because the holy spirit was going to lead and guide and you know help and so on right so one thing that was very clear go preach go teach teach them whatever i have taught you go preach the good news etc so go baptize them etc right so so that thing was very clear but the whole methodology well he did not but when we look into the book of acts right and when we see the disciples doing this you know they followed the great commission they said okay we are empowered by the holy spirit we are called to be witnesses this is what the lord jesus told us and so they are you know they are 
actually doing the work and then we see a process evolving right what what happens gospel is preached okay um and then we see that okay people are born again so people are born again they have come to faith then we see this gathering if you see these communities even you know families whole families coming to christ you know like in the case of uh, you know the philippi the jailer the entire family right they they believed they were baptized and they all all of them came to christ right so we see the entire family so these communities of believers of uh, are established disciples are established so this gathering is what we we are you know we call as the churches and we see this you know this emerging of these gatherings this emerging of these communities the local churches and we see it in the book of acts okay so we we understand okay people are born again they gather together to worship god to seek god they are a community of people they are a household of faith and and when we see that from that community or from the household of faith there are others who are you know learning to hear from god and they are seeking god and then god is sending people out to do more of that more of what share the gospel get people established as in gatherings leaders raising up so we see more of that happening from the this community of believers so then we understand okay this making disciples of nations teaching others to observe all that he has taught us happens like this right it is through the emerging of these local churches and from the local churches you know again gospel being shared people going out etc so we see that um the we can, we can we can come we can infer we can conclude that the local church it's god's strategy the local church is god's idea god's strategy for what for evangelizing the world right for fulfilling the great commission we see that the local church is god's strategy yes there are different kinds of ministries in the, within you know the fivefold ministry we look at it the apostle prophet pastor evangelist teacher but they're all in the local church and the local church is actually god's idea god's strategy god's design for fulfilling fulfillment of the great commission and the fulfillment of the great commission is evangelizing sharing of this good news with the whole world okay so we are studying about the local church we are looking at the mission of the local church and we see that hey this is god's idea this is god's strategy for evangelism evangelism right and um, which means that planting of more churches and um, you know when we should not i think when we see you know more churches coming up mushrooming of you know individual churches and well it's a good thing if people are equipped and if people are you know if people have the good right heart and if, and their vision is hey, uh, i have a burden for this kind of people and i have a burden for this community i have a burden for maybe the jain community for the you know the muslim community and for the sikh community and you know if the, more and more churches are coming out and it's a good thing right which means that the great commission is being fulfilled which means that god's strategy is actually you know we see people have got a grip of that and they are actually carrying it out it's growing yeah so uh, the local church is god's strategy for world's world evangelization so that's the mission of the church right for so which means that when a church grows and when i say grow i'm talking about people growing up right numerical growth spiritual growth like we could have thousands of people and all could be like babes in christ right that is a possibility like Paul says to the Corinthian church you know I know you, you you were always very spiritual but then you are still carnal you're not able to receive what I want to teach you're still carnal why because you're fighting you know you have strife you're fighting against this you're saying okay I'm of this I'm of Paul I'm of Apollos you know you're still carnal so Paul, Paul is saying you know you're you're still babies in Christ okay, so we could so it's not about just the numbers numbers do matter because it means that you're actually fulfilling the commission 
people are being blessed people are hearing the gospel people are being rooted you know it's a good thing but it also numerical growth and spiritual growth and we say spiritual growth people are being you know maturing in christ coming to the saving i mean coming to uh, be more like christ christ like maturity right so both need to go hand in hand so when when people mature when there is growth in the church then people are also the church is also planting other churches you know there are people from here they say hey, i've got the vision i know what it is i know and i also got the vision and the emphasis of this local church and let's go and let's do a work here let's do a work over there let's do a work you know so we can't say okay these guys are you know very ambitious what's the what's the you know why can't they have one you know one church and just focus and just you know make sure that everything happens there you know as one family why are they why are, why are they ambitiously looking at you know planting churches and they are just uh, you know maybe they are 40 in number maybe they are 50 in number why is the need for another church why can't they grow to 1000 or 2000 and then plant another church well you know that's a that's a wrong thinking because scriptural thinking is that if people are rising up if people have the vision if people are maturing in Christ if people have a call then they should be released how many people were there in the church in Antioch we don't know right we know some names that are being mentioned there right how many people were there in church in you know uh, Jerusalem or church in Ephesus we don't know but we see that this church was actually influencing you know uh, reaching out planting other churches right so so the thing is that we don't need to restrict ourselves and saying okay i need to grow to be maybe 10000 congregation and then we will look at planting other churches no, not necessary right if god has given a vision and if god is putting a burden to reach out to a particular area the burden can be for an area the burden can be for a particular community um, community meaning you know a language spoken by people or maybe from a different ethnic background whatever right if god is putting a burden then well we need to follow. Okay. so that's about the mission right so then this second thing the second m that we're looking at is the message okay so what is the message of the church Right. what is the message that they're going to communicate primarily the main thing is to preach the gospel right what is the gospel okay what is the good what is the good news that you're going to preach christ is alive jesus died for sinners like us huh jesus rose huh? or oh, sorry what did he say jesus died for our sins message of the cross okay so god loves us ah uh, sorry his works yeah okay. saved through his blood right so so the gospel is that lord jesus came into the world to save the sinners he lived a sinless life right he uh, carried the sin of the entire world upon him and uh, on the cross and he dealt with it he carried our sickness he said carried our curse he died he rose again and because of his death burial and resurrection we are born again if anybody would believe if anybody would believe in their hearts and confess with their mouth that jesus is lord they are born again they are saved right so so we see that that is the gospel okay, so we are called to preach that right okay and um, like signs, the work, signs, wonders, and you know, miracles and everything, yeah, that follows that. And 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul writes and he says, Okay, this is this is the message. Okay, this is the message of the cross. And I'm not preaching it with wisdom of words, but it's with power. Okay, so he he, he talks all that, right? He says all that. Sorry. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1, if you look at verse 24, um, says but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, right? So the message of the cross is not just mere words, but it's also the wisdom of God. It is the power of God being displayed. Because 
the gospel is goes directly against breaking cancelling the power of sin right uh, if you look at romans 1 uh, paul says that right <coughs> Romans chapter 1 verse 16 okay Romans 1 verse 16 okay Romans 116 Paul very very clearly he just says I am not ashamed okay what is it I'm not ashamed of what I'm not ashamed of the gospel of the good news of this good news I'm not ashamed why he says for it is the power of God for salvation to salvation for everyone who believes it is the power of god for salvation so this salvation is bringing from death to life is bringing from sin to you know to holiness and righteousness bringing from darkness or kingdom of darkness kingdom of satan to kingdom of god by right? kingdom of life so that is only through this good news nothing else it can't be a self help it can't be a self improvement it can't be you know uh, our own personal striving it, that cannot right that can change us that and reform a person to a certain extent but this work of sin to righteousness of darkness to light is only through the gospel so he's saying i'm not ashamed because this is the power of god to salvation for everyone who believes greeks jews first and also for the greek look at verse 17 for in it the righteousness of god is revealed from faith to faith as it is written the just shall live by faith okay so a simple message profound truth a simple message a powerful experience right a simple message at the same time it just cancels the power of sin so he's saying i'm not ashamed of it okay and it reveals the righteousness of god and how does one person a person experience this the power of god which cancels sin how does one person experience it it is through faith so it's like and that is why it's for everyone right everyone can believe anyone can put their faith it's you don't have to be born a jew in order to have a faith right or believe you can be you know you can be anything you can be an atheist but if you come to put your faith in the gospel then you immediately experience the power of god in your life to cancel sin right and uh, to experience righteousness so so this is it right this is the message paul also writes about as we go through the epistles paul also writes about okay what this is the primary thing okay this is the core thing that the church should not forget right we are looking at the mission the method Oh, sorry the the mission the message and the method right so the message of the church should primarily be the gospel never forget that so if a church is not preaching the gospel which means we not doing what we are supposed to be doing right the purpose is lost right at the core of it something is wrong we're just talking about something we're talking about politics we're talking about you know current affairs and that's it you're not preaching the gospel right so the church should in order to come back to the focus and reclaim the purpose the church should preach the gospel okay then paul writes about several things that are happening you know in his ministry so this is what he says okay um you know acts chapter 20 and verses 20 21 and also 27 okay acts chapter 20 let's read through this right how i kept back nothing that was helpful but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house testifying to Jews and also to Greeks repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ for verse 27 says for i have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God okay i'm not shunned meaning i've not stopped withhold withheld myself from declaring to you the whole counsel of God Okay, so if you look at Acts twenty, he is um, this these words. He is actually sharing. He's he's telling the the elders from the church in Ephesus 
and he calls this is the last time that he's talking to them this is the last time he's meeting them face to face so uh, they come to this place called miletus and and paul is there and he's is telling them and he's saying you know in ephesus if you study the book of acts he spends about 3 years okay, during his missionary journey right so it must have been one long missionary journey right if you spend 3 years in one place as part of your journey you know 3 like years he's been teaching there right so um he's been you know teaching everything and he's saying you know you remember i spent time teaching you i have not held back from declaring to you the whole counsel of god okay so that's the thing the whole counsel of god you know what does god say uh, about several things several matters and uh, what that teaching that uh, that impacts the person as a whole right well the person you know he he or she becomes a believer the person goes to work comes back home to a family maybe the person gets married spouse children is working earning a salary right and maybe you know call into ministry maybe leading a church you know now the person as, as an individual you know has all these things surrounding them okay so when you talking when you talk to them when you share them the word of god you need to share the whole counsel of god the church needs to address the whole counsel right them as a whole how to help a person you know at work you know is work important for them should they be going to work regularly should they be doing a good work what should be you know it's not enough that okay a person is praying praying in the spirit a person is you know just worshiping and all that is fine but then if they go to work and if they you know if they're not doing a good job right then they are actually dishonoring god right or if they are lying cheating you know financial financial dealings they're not uh, you know they're not sincere and uh, you know then actually they are being a false witness <clears throat> so the whole counsel of god addresses all these things marriage how should they treat their wives how should they treat their husband children you know how you know are they important should you be spending time all those things need to be addressed so that's the whole council right so whose responsibility is it that's the mission that's the purpose of the church right if you if you you know if you consider the world today and you know uh, right in this you know school uh, and campuses there's a lot of you know confusion about gender identity um there's a lot of pull of addictions uh, and you know like all these things are happening so who would address it right obviously the church has to address it which means you know it's not just the you know it's not just the leadership it's not just the you know the senior pastor or, ever, or whoever but it is also the church of god meaning this is the ecclesia the people of god right so this whole council needs to be addressed okay needs to be communicated if you look at one more scripture first timothy chapter 4 verse 16 or uh, 6 and verse 16 you know paul writes and he's saying uh, to the to timothy if you instruct the brethren in these things you will be a good minister of jesus christ nourished in the words of faith and all of, of uh, sorry and all doctrine which you have carefully followed verse 16 take heed to yourself and to the doctrine continue in them for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you okay Again. about teaching the people of god about instructing the people of god he's talking about good doctrine like good teaching sound teaching he's saying you know you need to of course follow it yourself take care of yourself and uh, and you you do this to others you will save both yourself and those who hear you okay so which means the whole counsel of god the gospel of course is the main thing the whole counsel of god has to be shared okay so sometimes we think okay you know if i 
talk about work, if I talk about finances, if I talk about those things, it seems very less spiritual, right? Rather than if I'm sharing one message about gifts of the spirit and about prayer and fasting and worship, that sounds more spiritual. I'm getting more amen and you know people are raising their hands and in between they're saying hallelujah and all that. But I'm, if I'm telling them about money and how they should treat and how they can invest, it's like people are thinking this pastor is too worldly. You know, he's more of the world than of the word. You know, so he's saying, okay, I, I will not, <laughs> I will not talk about that. Or if we're talking about marriage and all that, pastor, you know, this is important. Go share the gospel. Leave the home. <laughs> you know, let them take care of themselves. We'll go just like Paul, place to place. We'll go share. Fam, God, they let them. You know, go. Bible says. He who loves me and then hates his you know, own family, father, mother. You know, if he does not hate, then they are not worthy. So we take that verse also. Right. But the thing is this: who designed? The question, who designed? Who designed marriage? Who designed family? Who designed, you know, this whole thing called work? Who designed it? God. Right. So therefore, we need to share that whole counsel. Okay. Then we go on to the next thing, you know. Yeah, sure. Question, yeah. Pastor, in um, uh, line with the uh, chapter, uh, uh, verse 6, I think, no? yeah. Uh, um, if you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of good doctrine, which you have carefully followed. So at times, um, we are also uh, feeble, vulnerable, yeah. and uh, uh, certain areas in our life that, you know, we have not lived up to the expectations right but then when god prompts you to preach as a pastor and uh, to bring the message to right. the people that he's put across so how do we actually you know deal with uh, those uh, scenarios deal with those times yeah deal with those times so the, the 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 general rule of thumb is this you you learned you put to practice and you preach teach it that's the thing you know yes there are certain things that you've not uh, matured into, maybe, you know, that we have not matured into, that we are still works in progress, we are still grappling, we are still coming into terms, right? But that doesn't that doesn't mean that we should not teach because it's in the word. So you go ahead, based on the authority of God's word, this is what God's desire is, this is what God's will is, do that. You know, this is what God expects of us. And so you share from that perspective and saying that. You don't have to say, you know, I've not got it myself. You know, but then you know in your heart that you're also making the journey along with all the believers who are in the church. So, um, so that we can actually go ahead and do that, right? Okay. Um, so um, there's a question here: Should a local church focus on a local area or focus on all around the church, all around the world? Okay. So, so that's a, that's a, that's a, that is what we are addressing. So we see the in the pattern that we see in the Book of Acts. And uh, also, we see that it's God's heart to reach the entire world. So it's it goes beyond our geographical local area. It goes beyond that. You know, that's God's vision, right? So, so for a church to be doing that is scriptural, right? So the thing is this: um, sometimes we see that yes, as a you know, what is the call? What is the call of God for? What is the vision that God has given us as a local church, right? Um, uh, what is he, what has he called us to do? What has he called us to focus on? And that's a important question to consider also, right? To see, because with the call of God comes the gifting, the provisions and everything, right? So, uh, so maybe, you know, as a church leader, elder, pastor, whatever, you know, has God given you, have, have we come to that revelation and understanding that he has called us for the whole world right and is that a re revelation in our heart is that a conviction in our heart okay so then we know that yes we will move in that direction okay so we don't do it just because it's a good idea you know we we know that it needs to be a revelation it needs to be a conviction uh, but in the scripture we see that as a local church you are called to impact the world right you are called to impact the world now your sphere of influence could be different right your sphere of influence could be you know maybe many local churches or it could be 
it could be something that you're doing you know now with technology you know it could be something but your sphere of influence again you know we see it the church makes a journey we're going to look at that you know how a church makes a journey right how, like as a body of believers you make a journey from being you know two or three believers and gathering together you make a journey where god uses you and uses people who are raised up from among you to impact a wider you know a wider sphere of influence right so your influence also grows as a local church it it journeys you journey from a place of mature from a immaturity to maturity and from a place of maturity to an even greater place of maturity so with that growth also comes a, a sphere of influence right an increase in the sphere of influence so um so to the answer that question well a pastor should focus on the local church but also need to understand that god's vision is for uh, for that sphere of influence to grow right it will definitely grow beyond um but we need to make that journey you know being faithful in what god is interested um you know being uh, and continuing to seek him continuing to have that passion have, continuing to have god's heart and then you you know the sphere of influence grows right so no need to compare and say okay i'm i don't want to be like this church no you are a unique you know body of christ and and uh, yeah but your sphere of influence is also going to grow right but you need to make that journey right okay i hope that helps danny daniel okay so um lucy has mentioned kingdom of god so um i'm not sure what that was in reference to okay okay let's um, oh it is answer for that question is it okay okay yeah yeah kingdom of god you know again talking about the domain the rule and reign of the king the domain of the king yeah so we need to have that perspective when we refer to the kingdom of god yeah um okay okay then then the church's mission in when it comes to the message also to is to guard against every wind of doctrine right so paul is very clear ephesians 4 verses 14 and 15 okay this is what he says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine so he's talking about you know that wind blowing shifting this side that side so he's saying we should not be carried by every wind of doctrine and that doctrine which is coming by the trickery of men right so he's saying by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head jesus christ who is the head christ so so he's saying you know there is yes there are these winds of doctrine which is coming by because of man's fleshly yeah you know attempts or trickering trickery or cunningness right by intentionally wanting to deceive because it's you know they just want to you know bible talks about how some people were uh, peddling the word of god i think peter also refers to that right peddling the word of god meaning adultery adulterating the word for their personal gains right so so that is happening so you, so paul is saying you need to guard yourself Okay, so now, how do we bring in truth, right? How do we bring in truth when there's a lot of maybe error, and then maybe the, even the congregation seems to go, uh, you know, just being swayed by that? Okay, so the best way to bring in or remedy that situation, change that situation, is to amplify the truth or to speak the truth, the preach the truth, teach it, amplify it. Okay, do, so don't just talk about errors or just talk about those things and say okay this person is saying that that person is saying that what is the truth right when you amplify the truth automatically the error is exposed when you're amplifying the truth mean when you are highlighting the truth when you are making that loud the truth which is from scripture this is what god says this is what is written in the word right uh maybe people are saying he gives us sees uh you know all these uh you know the, the power of god and everything is not for today's church all these has come to an end with the day of the 
you know this apostles all that is ended what is the best way to you know to correct that not to go and say okay this person is saying that that person is saying that this ministry is saying that and it's it's wrong and and all that no the best thing is to teach what does the word of god say about that topic right what does the word of god say about this topic what does the word of god say about communion you know for example you know yesterday I just had a conversation and this boy was saying you know i don't want to take communion he's a believer so i was asking you know why he says i'm not yet i've not yet taken baptism what a baptism okay so so i i said yeah i mean um, so aren't you a believer you are a believer and this is what the word of god says that you can right so uh, but he said uh, no i i have not you know i've heard churches say that unless you're born again water baptized you cannot take partake of the bapt uh, you know communion sacrament so so i've you know so i just was sharing from the word you know this is what it is this is what it what does it represent and who can do that and what does water baptism represent and who's called to do that how does one qual qualify for communion how does one qualify for water baptism right um well still he said still he said you know my personal conviction is that i want to take baptism i've made a decision like that i said fine that's fine but then this is what the word of god says about baptism you know if you personally say i want to do this and after only that i will do this that is absolutely fine that's a personal opinion personal choice but the word of god does not put such qualifications put such restrictions limitations whatsoever right so so we're just looking at that so the best way to maybe address something which is not right is to amplify the truth and truth from god's word and paul says you know you speak the truth in love don't you know use truth as a now we know truth is the word of god is a uh, you know it's is a weapon right it's a sword of the spirit right and uh, it's it's needs to be used against the spiritual powers of darkness right the, maybe they are fire you know the spiritual powers of darkness you're getting arrows of um you know doubts and discouragement and lies and all that so you're supposed to use the sword of the spirit which is the word of god the you know in the rema word of god efficient 6 right but don't use it against your fellow believer and cut them to pieces right saying speak the truth in love right you address the truth but you speak it in love you know respect the person honor the person speak the truth in love okay so guarding against every wind of doctrine um first timothy chapter 6 and verses 3 and 5 Three to five. You know, it says, if anyone teaches otherwise, meaning you know whatever is wholesome and truth, you know, if even anyone is teaching opposite of that, I'm saying does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness. You know, look at this teaching, which goes along with godliness, meaning you know purity and holiness and all that. You know. then that person is proud knowing nothing obsessed with disputes arguments over words from which come envy strife reviling evil suspicions useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain okay from such you just withdraw yourself he's saying right so so just describing okay uh, the the opposite of wholesome teaching right um this is there is a teaching which does not go with living living a holy life living a godly life it doesn't go hand in hand so uh it does not accord with godliness right so which is opposite of that he's saying you know that person is obviously you know he is ignorant he does not he's not i or intentionally you know he's he's um, he's proud he's obsessed obsessed with what wants to dispute things wants to just you know there's a lot of envy and strife and all these things so you know just you just distance yourself right okay right okay so so there is that place of engaging amplifying truth which means if people are sincere you know they are seeking and but they are in error 
right? They are maybe they're in their lifestyle, in their practices, maybe in their beliefs. There is an error, but it's you know it's it's misplaced faith, right? They are sincere, sincerely wrong. So for such, speak the truth in love. But then, if people are intentionally, you know, deceitful, intentionally saying, "Okay, we will do this," then no amount of reasoning, no amount of placing the truth before them. Maybe you, you, you we need to definitely do that. But then, if they continue on those ways, on those lines, he says, you know, they are. Look at this. The last uh, part of that verse five it says, "Who suppose that godliness is a means of gain?" Okay, for them. Living a godly life, or whatever, or, or this whole thing of ministry itself is a means of gain for them. It's a business, right? It's a means by which I I get I get wealthy, I get rich, but I, this is the this is my method by which I get wealth. So for them, when when you see that they are destitute of truth, okay, destitute of truth, meaning they don't want anything to do with truth, right? Whatever you call as a truth, truth is not part of their value in life right? they're destitute of truth so from such people you need to distance so there is a place in engaging there is a place for engaging in order to bring truth in order to guard but then there is also a place where you disengage and you distance yourself and you know that there is no sincerity but it's not from a place of seeking and wanting to know um, or it's not from a place of ignorance but it is intentionally, you know, all these things are happening. So you disengage and distance yourself. Right? Okay. Um, okay. So we looked at uh, the mission. We looked at the message. Um, okay. Now we have a question. We give uh, confirmation to a believer. How can we give confirmation to a believer that being part of communion? Doesn't require water baptism. Is there any verse? Uh, it would be helpful. Okay, okay. So, um, so we looked at um, the Corinthian church. We looked at how uh, Paul is also ministering to the Corinthian church, and he's writing to them, and he's saying, you know, you need to do this, uh, and um, you need to. Um, um, he says, the Lord Jesus. This is how he instructed. I think it's in one Corinthians ten, right, or is it uh, Second Corinthians? Um, he gives the instruction to the church, and he says, "You do this as long as you, as often as you meet." Now, when we, um, yeah, sorry, one Corinthians eleven, right, eleven twenty three to twenty six. So he's giving them. He's just, you know, placing what you should do, how you, sh how you should do this, etc. Okay, so now we need to understand that in the early church, being born again, baptized in water. Everything happened together, right? They're born again, baptized in water, or born again, filled with the Spirit, baptized in water, whatever. You know, it was all happening successively, simultaneously. For example, in Acts, um, you know, when we read about um, the church in Samaria, Acts chapter 8, uh, we see that, okay, gospel was preached. Peter and John go there, pray over them. They are filled in the Spirit. But before that, they are baptized in water. So we see all these things going together. Unfortunately, in today's church, right, we see all these being separate. Right? We see we are a church which has come out of the dark ages. We have church. We have we have come out of you know we are in the restorative moves of God. And you see, look at the global church, right? So these events are separate, and you know, so that's the thing. So there is a need to teach. There is a need to teach them about water baptism. There is a need to teach about, yeah. So, what does communion represent? What does water baptism represent? So that's the thing. So, the thing is to teach the people and say, hey, there is no order. Whether it's Holy Spirit baptism, whether it's water baptism, whether it's, you know, there is no order in this. This is what Scripture says. These are sacraments. This is what it signifies. Who should take it? Any believer. One who is a believer in the Lord Jesus should take. Does the Bible restrict anyone from not doing this? Yes. Who? Only if the person is not a believer. 
a person believes, you qualify, right? For all these, you know, both water baptism and uh, communion. So that is what we have in scripture. So since we don't have any order in place, since we don't have any qualifying factor in place or a, you know, or a restriction in place, this is what it is. Go ahead, take it, right? So that's the that's the best way to teach the people, right? Because there's no scripture saying, okay, first you be, you know, you do this and then you do that. There's no scripture. So there's no order. But we do have scripture saying what it signifies and why we do it. So that is what it is. Someone who's just a believer, that's the best thing. No, they don't. They don't need to see. Let's say in a service, okay. Uh, and just before you, just before you, you're ministering in baptism, you give an altar call. Okay, you're saying, okay, anyone here who's not a believer? Now, this is for believers. This is for disciple. Lord, say, is there anyone here? And you want to be, you want to receive Jesus? Somebody puts their hands up. Go ahead, lead them into Christ. Lead them in, in into you know the salvation prayer and Christ and. And then serve baptism. I mean, serve uh, communion because, yeah, and that becomes even more clearer for them. Hey, this is what it is. He was nailed on the cross. He took my sin, and the cup that I'm drinking, you know, it talks about the sacrifice. It becomes even more clearer for them, and even more joyful that they have just received Christ and they take part in communion. So, see, it, yeah. So the so the baptism, like Philip. With the Ethiopian eunuch, he receives Christ. He knows only the Old Testament. He's a Jewish believe, Jewish man. I mean, Jewish person. That's it. Cornelius' house, all non-Jewish people. They are there. In fact, they are. We know that they have received because they have just as they hear, they are like they are already anticipating, expecting. As they hear, they are becoming believers, and the Holy Spirit is poured out on them. They are experiencing gift of tongues. And then Peter says, okay, now we are going to baptize you. You already experienced the Holy Spirit. And so, so that's the thing, you know. So the thing is to this, you know, it comes from a place of sincerity. Like this whole teaching thing. We don't want people to do it in ignorance. Because there are people, you know, um, who sometimes, you know, say, I took baptism, water baptism, but I did it because everybody was doing it. Yeah, nobody, you know, nobody told me. They just said, you know, you know, you're following Jesus, now you do it. But now I realize what it actually means, and I want to get baptized again. And I said, because we asked them, you know, aren't you already baptized? Why do you want? But they, they say I did it in ignorance. So we can, in order to avoid all this, you know, these classes and teaching, and so it comes from a place of um, uh, the the person should do it with full understanding. But it should not be a restricting factor. Yeah, so some, like a legalistic thing, you know, if a person believes, then we should think. Huh? In the... Uh, we are saying like, uh -huh. water baptism is just being born again. No, water baptism is... Um, is something that declares, is actually a proclamation of you being born again, right? So something has already happened, and you're taking baptism to declare that it's a proclamation of that. Right? So that that doesn't cause a person to be born again. You're born again, and baptism actually is proclaiming that, saying, "Okay, this is what happened to this person. I was dead. I'm I'm I was dead to sin, but now I'm alive in Christ." So, so it's not the other way around, right? Okay, so we'll stop here, and then we'll um, meet next week. Okay, thank you. God bless. Bye.